Welcome to One Healthy World. I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And I'm Dr. Gemma Newman, also known as the Plant Power Doctor. And this is our last episode. I'm kind of sad, but kind of excited because we've learned a lot, Dr. Newman. We really have. And I hope that everybody listening feels really empowered now in terms of how to control their diabetes. Absolutely. We've been talking so much about these foods that can really get us into this mess, but then also the foods that can help get us out of it as well. Yeah. And today, what we're going to be focusing on is type 1 diabetes. And we're going to be sharing a little bit more about how Diet can improve our outcomes regardless of the underlying condition. Absolutely. It's so important that we, we realize that diet can definitely benefit you if you have type 2 diabetes. But as Dr. Neil Barnard reports, if you have type 1 diabetes, there can be some big benefits as well. We know that a healthy vegan diet is the diet of choice for type 2 diabetes. It helps people lose weight, and it also helps the muscle and liver cells to rid themselves of fat so they can respond to insulin better. But what about type 1? Can a plant-based diet help in type 1 diabetes too? Now, in type 1 diabetes, the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas are gone. They've been destroyed by an autoimmune reaction. So people with type 1 diabetes need insulin injections. And no amount of diet change will make type 1 diabetes go away. The usual approach followed by many doctors is to ask people with type 1 diabetes to limit their carbohydrate intake, and to carefully track their portion sizes so they can calculate exactly how much insulin they're going to need. However, our research team, headed by Dr. Hanna Kaliova, used something very different. We recruited 35 people with type 1 diabetes, and we asked half of them to follow a conventional diet. We asked the other half to follow a low-fat vegan diet, just like the diet that's used for type 2. And there were no limits on carbohydrates, no limits on portions. And at first, that really made the participants nervous because they imagined that all that extra carbohydrate from rice or beans or fruit or starchy vegetables would make their blood sugar spike, cause them to need extra insulin. It's not what happened. As time went on, they needed less insulin. 28% less, to be exact. Their insulin sensitivity more than doubled, meaning they were responding much better to insulin. And they also lost unwanted weight. And they felt great. How is this possible? It turns out that people with type 1 diabetes not only have a lack of insulin, fat can build up in their cells, causing insulin resistance, just like in type 2. When they get away from cheese, from meat, from french fries, and other fatty foods, the fat in the cells starts to dissipate, insulin resistance starts to go away, they find they need less insulin. They still have to inject it, but their bodies use it more readily. And over the long run, this healthy way of eating does something else. It protects their heart, protects their arteries. So the moral of the story is that for any form of diabetes, a healthy plant-based diet is just what the doctor ordered. I love to learn, and I feel like I just learned a lot. Did not know that people who have type 1 diabetes also have some insulin resistance as well. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that. And when they adopt a more whole food plant-based diet, they find that insulin resistance melts away and they need less insulin to control their diabetes. You know, I was just talking with Dr. Brian Carlson from the Mayo Clinic, as well as Lauren Plunkett from Mastering Diabetes, both of whom have type 1 diabetes. And they were able to talk about how through diet and exercise, they've been able to reduce their insulin requirements in half. I mean, that's a huge drop. It is. And I think when you have type 1 diabetes, you're going to be wanting to look at all the ways in which you can improve your insulin sensitivity. What we put on our plate is one way. The way that we move our bodies is another way. Exercise is so crucial. And in some ways, because it encourages us to use our glycogen stores in our muscles, it almost replaces the need for that a little bit of that insulin because it does the same job. You know, I feel like we've talked about food a lot, but when it comes to diabetes, you were also mentioning to me off camera that there are some environmental triggers as well. What did you mean by that? Well, with type 1 diabetes, there are definite genetic triggers for some people. And in addition to that, there are some environmental triggers. We don't always know why it starts, but in some susceptible individuals, viruses could be implicated, trauma. And in some studies, they've even found a connection with the consumption of cow milk protein. Of what protein now? Cow milk protein. Cow protein. Oh my goodness. So dairy, huh? 
sometimes there's at least two or three studies I've read that linked dairy to uh, the development of type 1 diabetes by a process known as molecular mimicry. So basically your pancreatic beta cells, the ones that make insulin, look a lot like those dairy proteins. And so if your body is mounting an immune reaction to one, it may mount the same immune reaction to the other. I'm curious, in the UK where you're from over in London, is there a big push for dairy is healthy like there is here in the United States as well? In some quarters there really is, and I find that quite interesting because there is, dairy can be a real mixed bag. And I think it's helpful for people to know that those links exist because it may impact their um, dietary choices, especially if they have people in their family that have type 1 diabetes. So let's talk about, uh, I want to, before we go to our culinary whiz and Christine, I wanna just pick your brain as well, give some people some practical tips. So uh, what are some healthy, again, diabetes friendly snacks that as a doctor you might suggest to your patients who have diabetes, whether it be type one or type two? Well, I particularly favor snacks that are high in fiber. Um, so fruit is a great one. People don't need to worry about fruit if they have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And again, I'm a massive fan of trail mix. I think it's a great satiating snack that's a healthy whole food and gives you a lovely amount of uh, protein as well as healthy fats. If you're making trail mix and you throw like raisins in there or apricots or dates, you know, those are dried fruits. Is that something that we have to be alarmed by as well, we need to watch out for because it's a dried fruit and not a whole fruit? We don't need to be alarmed by it, but we need to be aware that it is a more concentrated sugar, so it may have an impact on our blood sugar more quickly than something that was more attached to fiber, like a whole fruit. Well, I tell you what, those are some great suggestions, but I think that we should turn to our culinary whiz and Christine to come up with some more from us because uh, she has an exciting uh, carb-rich option. Again, carbs and diabetes, two things that often don't go together in most people's minds, but she has an enticing, what she calls, I love this, an actually exciting, and yeah, actually exciting quinoa and lentil salad. It sounds tasty. And Christine, what do you have for us? Quinoa. It's not just birdseed, people. It's fancy birdseed. Hey friends, it's Anne from Veggie Minifique, your go-to for holistic wellness and a healthy vegan lifestyle. Let's be real. Quinoa has a bit of a PR problem. People hear quinoa and they think, bland, boring, and why does this taste like the inside of a couch cushion? But today, we're flipping the quinoa script. We're giving it crunch, tang, and excitement. I'm talking about a quinoa and lentil salad that may just make you into a quinoa convert. Wait for it. Just really quickly, in case I lost you at salad, here are some of the key components of a really good salad. So first off, your base, greens or grain in this case. Crunch, because differing textures is key. Protein for nutrition and to fill you up. A healthy fat to provide richness and keep you fuller longer. Herbs and fresh flavors to add vibrancy and brightness. Of course, tang for a zesty kick. Sweetness. A touch of sweetness can balance out the other savory flavors. Dressing, a good dressing ties everything together. And seasoning to make the flavors pop. So here's what you'll need today. Cooked quinoa, not mushy, not overcooked. You'll want a little crunch. Green or black lentils. Any veggies or roasted veggies that you like that are in season. Sauerkraut for a tangy probiotic boost. A handful of fresh parsley and mint chopped. Herbs equal life, guys. A small shallot, finely minced, because shallots are like onions, but fancier. Roasted almonds or pistachios. Okay, first let's talk quinoa basics. Always rinse it really well before cooking to remove the natural coating called saponin, which can make quinoa taste bitter. Once it's done, fluff it with a fork and then let it cool completely before adding it to the salad. And now for the dressing. You're going to whisk together one garlic clove grated or minced, zest and juice of a lemon, trust me, this is key, tahini, keeping it silky and simple, a touch of maple syrup, and then salt, pepper, and a pinch of cumin or smoked paprika to keep things interesting. This lemony mix isn't just delicious, it's also functional. Did you know that the vitamin C in the lemon helps your body to absorb the iron from the lentils? Science for the win. In a big bowl, combine all your salad fixings and drizzle on that lemony dressing and toss it like you're in a cooking show montage. It's fresh, zesty, and loaded with nutrients to keep you going strong. Tell me that's not an amazing quinoa salad. Tell me, honestly. So good. 
to her credit, that was an actually exciting lentil and quinoa salad. And Christine is a whiz, Dr. Newman. She certainly is. That looked delicious. All right. We are in the home stretch, our final episode in our look at diabetes. So what are some other tips that you might want to suggest? So I think for anyone living with diabetes, whether it's type 1 or type 2, they're going to want to not only focus on what's on their plate, but the other aspects of their lifestyle as well. So for example, exercise, as I mentioned previously, can be really helpful for improving insulin sensitivity. And so can looking after your mental health, making sure that you've got good routines, good sleep patterns, for example, and making sure that you do all that you can in your lifestyle to reduce stress. All right, and a couple of uh, big things that have come up over the years on the exam room as well. Uh, number one, I've heard from a certain number of people who switch over to an exclusively whole food plant-based diet and initially actually see their blood sugar levels increase. Is that something you've heard of? It's something I've heard of, but interestingly, I've not seen that in my patients. When they do it in a completely whole food plant-based diet, quite often you have to be really mindful that their blood sugars don't drop too quickly. So it's actually really important if you are insulin dependent to do this in conjunction with your doctor because they may be surprised at the sudden drop in your insulin requirements. Having said that, if you've built up a lot of insulin resistance in your muscle cells, it's possible that at the very beginning of that transition, you might see your blood sugars rise, but then over a course of a few days and a few weeks, you should see it coming down again. Outstanding. I love to hear that, and I love the fact that this is a disease that is projected to affect hundreds of millions of people, as we have heard, and the numbers continue to climb. But it sounds like, from everything we've learned over these past episodes, we have way more control than we realize. We do, and I'd love for people to take that message away with them from these episodes, because I think one of the things about the modern world and sometimes the modern medical system is that people feel disempowered. They feel like they can't change anything. But actually, if they know this kind of information, then they do have the power in their own hands to make such a big difference. Absolutely. And hopefully our episodes here have been the catalyst for change, you know, because I always think of it as if we can help one person make that change and then they inspire somebody else, it's like that ripple effect when you throw a, pond, a pebble into a pond. Yeah, it is. And it's a beautiful thing. And hopefully many people people will benefit from this. Season went by fast, didn't it? It did. It flew by. Yeah. I've had such a good time, though. Yeah, I had a great time. I want to thank Dr. Neil Barnard for all of his incredible research and sharing that with us. And of course, Anne Christine and her actually exciting quinoa and lentil recipes and so many others. The pasta. I mean, she just is a whiz in the kitchen. She's amazing. And lastly, I would like to thank our audience, every single one of you who's watched One Healthy World. Thank you for joining us. And I really hope that you found it useful. And for everybody here at the Physicians Committee, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. And I'm Dr. Gemma Newman, also known as the Plant Power Doctor, and we will see you again next time.